Welcome to this episode of Hampton Roads Business Live. My name is Rory Graham, I'm your host, and today we have the pleasure of having Melissa Howe from the Howe Law Group in Norfolk with us. Um, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you for well, having me, I appreciate it. That's good. I, you know, I, I uh, had a chance to talk with you last week on the phone, and uh, it was very interesting because I deal with lawyers in my field quite a bit, but I don't have the opportunity to deal with lawyers that, um, or attorneys that, that um, uh, are practicing in the area that you practice in. And so that was a very interesting conversation. Why don't you give us an overview of what you do? Okay. Well, I have been in the legal field for about 17 years. In the past 11, I've been focusing exclusively on labor and employment law. Mm -hmm. And so as part of my practice, I, I left a nationwide firm to um, start my own firm that helps small and mid-sized business, businesses primarily in all areas related to employment law. So everything t um, relating to their employees and any issues that they may face having employees. Okay, so let's define your typical client because you said small and medium-sized business. Give, give me that like a number of employees because I know it's a broad range. Well, I have businesses that I work with starting at, at five or so employees all the way up to thousands of employees. Um, so I help a wide range of businesses and I will um, step into the role sometimes of uh, more of uh, the HR go-to person for all HR issues. So if you have a small company that has um, an office manager, for example, that person's tasked with wearing a variety of hats and they don't have the time uh, to focus on the HR issues. And so those people may reach out to me for more of the day-to-day -day issues on uh, employment, you know, employment related issues for the daily counseling as well as policy but they'll reach out more often because they don't have the capacity to fill that role with a person who's um, focusing strictly on HR. And then mm -hmm. on the other end of the spectrum, I work with uh, companies that have thousands of employees that have in-house counsel, and they may have a general counsel that oversees their whole legal department, um, but then they will have a person designated within the legal department that handles the employment issues. And so I work with that person, depending on their comfort level with different situations, um, to help them through the employment law issues. Okay, so could you give us an example of a personnel issue that might come up there where your expertise would be valuable? Well, from a policy perspective, I will have calls about classifications of employees or workers. Um, sometimes someone will ask, can I classify this person as an independent contractor or do they need to be an employee? And you have a lot of different agencies that have promulgated regulations, the IRS, the Virginia Employment Commission, Department of Labor, and so that classification is going to impact um, those various determinations about whether or not that person can be classified as a, a contractor or an employee. So I will help through that type of issue. There are calls that I get about um, you know, our policy, just general policies, handbooks, um, drafting of um, employment agreements. So if you have bringing on an executive and you want to negotiate an employment agreement with them, working the language up for that agreement. Um, then I'll get calls from day-to-day -day counseling issues. So we have a, an employee, for example, who has a disability or has a workers' comp injury, and we're trying to figure out, for example, with that employee, uh, how does the workers' comp uh, law interact with Family Medical Leave Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act? Are we covering all of the different requirements that we have to meet with those different regulations? And so it will start out, you know, different types of matters, but I also work with companies if they're actually sued for harassment or discrimination, for retaliation, or if there's been a complaint about a violation of another law and we have to make a, a disciplinary decision, for example, or a higher, uh, or excuse me, a um, uh, wage related, whether or not to give a promotion, whether or not to give a raise, and there will be litigation that may ensue from that. I will go into court or go into a government agency and help the company work through that issue to, to reach a resolution. Uh, do you find, I didn't ask you this before, so I don't want to blindside you, but okay. do, do, you, do you find that when you're, a lot of what you're talking about seems to be that you're going uh, to try to comply with government or you're trying to 
uh, companies to comply with regulations and mm -hmm. things like that. Do you find that the that it's like fighting city hall? I mean, for companies to go up against the government about uh, something if they feel they're right and. It, that's kind of, I know it's an individual thing. But. That's, no, it's no prob problem. They, it actually depends on the different situation, and that's such a lawyer answer. I'm sorry to say it depends, but um, there are agencies that you work with where the, and they change depending on the um, political appointments that are in the different agencies, the philosophies and the goals that they're um, going after. Um, the, the people that are administering those regulations or laws will change and so you'll have a different response from them. Um, so there are times when you go in and you know that this is the procedure and we will present um, our defenses and we've done what we need to and we will be, um, you know, we should be able to prevail on a claim. There are other times, for example, I had an audit with the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division where the response that you get back from the agency is is very challenging because that's not the way that the regulations have been interpreted in the past and so the guidance that has been given to companies um, isn't isn't as reliable as you would like it to be and common sense has nothing to do with it oftentimes <laughs> common sense has absolutely nothing to do when with when you're dealing it. with a government it <laughs> It doesn't seem to have much to do with it. Well, and I had an attorney, too, at a, a national firm in the area that I was talking to. It does not practice labor and employment law, and he gave me an example of an employee had stolen some materials, and he was talking to them about whether or not um, they had to be paid. And I said, well, you know, technically under the Virginia Wage Payment Act, you can't withhold the person's wages. And whether or not the Department of Labor and Industry will enforce it or not is a different issue. but. He said, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. If somebody's stolen from you, why do you have to pay them in full? And so that was an, you know, another common sense issue that's uh, well, it's oftentimes not an issue about you know, what you think the right thing to do is. It's making sure you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's. Well, you know, I think as a small business owner, I, I don't have, I'm not in an area where I have as many regulations, although I have a lot of them. I don't have to worry about some of them, or I'm just blind to some of them, but but, but I, a lot of times I'm filling out these forms and they're asking all these questions and I don't get it. I mean, what business of it is theirs, what this person does in their day-to-day -day routine or, or, or something. I, I can understand they want to know how much to pay them because they're going to get their hands on it. So I understand that they're they're trying to do that, but I don't, I, there's a lot of information I just don't, I just, I, I find it hard as a business person to understand what am I supposed to be complying with because right. you're busy running your business you're, you're not they don't even have time to read the bills before they may or vote on them so uh, how are we supposed to uh, um, follow all these regulations so we have to turn to people like you right. correct and that's yes. what you do so yes. you keep up on all what what's going on regulation wise and you made a statement to me, uh, you said you help companies protect themselves and their employees. Correct. So that's a good statement. <laughs> so well, that's a good tagline. And there, there are a lot of instances, I mean, as a business owner myself, you, you're expected to be a, a tax expert, um, a psychologist oftentimes, an uh, employment lawyer, plus know your business, plus market, um, and a variety of other things that you're tasked with knowing how to do or right. at least being f familiar enough with to um, put the right people in place or hire the correct people. And so that's really where I step in on the employment law perspective. And you were mentioning earlier about the um, questions that they ask yeah. and you know, what does this person do and all of that. A lot of times I will find that employers simply don't even know what questions to ask to make sure they're doing the right things. Right. And so that's really where I step in and can say, here are the issues that we are seeing most often. Let's address those issues and see if we have a problem. Um, and a prime example on the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor, um, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is a law that they administer or enforce, um, you have to look for employees whether or not they're classified properly and as salaried employees and, or as hourly employees. And a lot of employers think if I have an agreement with the employee and the employee would like to be paid that way and we have this mutual understanding that they're going to be paid a salary, that that's fine. And the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division 
enforcing the Fair Labor Standards Act said that that's not fine. Mm -hmm. There are only certain circumstances under which a person can be paid a salary. And you look at those different exemptions from the Fair Labor Standards Act, mm -hmm. and if an employee does not fit into one of those exemptions, you have to pay them overtime. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, and there are- there Well, that's being that if you, they're on salary, or they're working overtime, you know. Uh, Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, and I, I should clarify, and then and this is where a lot of employers uh, will, will interchange um, salary with exempt and uh, hourly with non-exempt. And there are some exceptions to that rule, so the words are not synonymous. But if you're paying an employee on a salary basis, then you should have an understanding about what um, requirements in their day-to-day -day job they have to be doing in order to be qualified to be paid a salary. Like every time I try to do something, I have to call my accountant and I have to call my tax guy and ask him what's the law say do I do or don't do or whatever right. to, to see. Um, so it's it just adds another expense you know to you so it's good to have someone like you that can keep you out of trouble because you don't even know you're getting in it, <laughs> you know, so well, really. And I worked in a national firm before I started my own firm, and one of the reasons why I left and started my own firm was because the focus seems to be on the larger companies and how can I um, bring in a company that I can, and I in fact had an attorney say this to me at one point, you want to bring in companies that you can bill ten to $25,000 a month that they're going to pass the bill to accounting and it's not going to matter. And I draw fulfillment from the people who are out there launching their businesses and building it to those larger companies. And they, they are investing so much and taking so much of a risk. Um, and when I'm able to step in and help them mm -hmm. and do it in a more efficient manner, uh, cost efficient and time efficient manner, then, I'm, then I really think that's what success is to me. And mm -hmm. so leaving a national firm leave, and, and even looking at the regional firms, their hourly rates can be so prohibitive at times. That when I launched my own firm, I was able to eliminate a lot of the overhead, a lot of the expense, and lower my hourly rate so that I can meet the, the needs of the small and mid-sized businesses in our mm -hmm. area. Well, I know there's a need out there, uh, especially with some of the things coming down the pike right now. There's more yes. regulations than ever coming out of D.C. And um, uh, what are the hot topics that you're hearing about now? Well, since we last spoke, actually, the OFCCP, which is the uh, department, uh, well, it's under the Department of Labor, but they are the division that really works with government contractors. They've um, issued a new manual, and they issued regulations um, com that are directed towards veterans and disability, or people with government contractors um, related to veterans and, and disabled individuals. So that's just happened in the last couple of days, and mm -hmm. you're just trying to keep up with that. But a lot of the, um, uh, the other hot topic issues are, for example, the ban the box campaign is what they're calling it. And that's with employees where they're trying to um, change the typical employment application where an employer will say, have you ever been convicted of a crime in the, or convicted of a felony? Um, some employers use you know, different language. They, they would like to ban that box entirely because the, the argument is that it has a disparate impact or that it's, um, um, it's impacting a certain group of our population. And they, they say that Hispanics and African Americans are disparately impacted by that certain question. And so they're, they've filed, the EEOC has filed various lawsuits, and, and ironically, the EEOC was challenged in one of, its, one of its first lawsuits about whether or not it asks its employees when it hires them, whether or not they've ever been convicted of a crime <laughs> before, and they, in fact, do, from what I understand, ask that well, question. Well, so don't so. do as I do, do as I say. Exactly, do. Right, exactly. So. So that, but that's one of the challenges that we're facing now, is that, you know, do we remove that entirely? And, and I'm advising a lot of the employers that you need to make it clear um, on your employment application that that will not um, exclude you from consideration for employment, but it's, it is a, a factor that's considered. But they, like, like I said, they, they have the ban the box campaign where they would like to eliminate it entirely. Well, uh, like I said, it does a lot of it's not even common sense that you have to, you can't say, well, it's just common sense that you do this. You can't rely on that anymore. Right. Right. So, uh, so it's good we have people like you. <laughs> is, you. is there something that I didn't mention that you'd like to talk about? 
No, I think we've covered we've it, covered and I appreciate your time. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I appreciate you coming in. And if you have a business, large or small, and would like help navigating all these regulations and uh, uh, laws that you have to deal with that you may or may not even uh, be aware of, uh, then uh, give Ms. Howell a call, uh, and her contact information is at the end of this video and uh, on this page. And uh, she's in Norfolk, and uh, I wish you a lot of success in your firm. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank and you. it's a pleasure having you in today. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Thank you.